So, so what is the end game for the United States in Africa? Oh, well, I think the United States probably needs to start thinking a little longer term in Africa. And we tend to deal with it uh, kind of on a crisis by crisis basis. We've tended to think of it as something of a humanitarian afterthought with the CNN effect or with uh, domestic uh, constituencies pushing for certain issues, we, we pay attention now and then. The last decade we started to see a change. 9-11, the attacks on the embassies in, in, uh, in Tanzania and Kenya in 1998. So the security threats are uh, proliferating, I would say, and they affect U.S. interests in more directly, I think, than they have in the past. Security threats in Africa affect American well, security? Yes, you have only to look at the bombing of the U.S. Embassy 98. in 98, exactly. But since then? Well, since then, I think the fear was that Africa becomes this permissive uh, open ground for and vulnerable to, to terror threats as, as we're successful in other parts of the world, but it becomes kind of a welcoming environment. When, when President Obama was asked about that, mm -hmm. he said, if, and I, I'm paraphrasing, he said, not everyone who wears a, a Lakers jersey becomes Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Meaning not anyone who calls themselves Al-Qaeda and maneuvers few guns in Mali becomes a threat to the United States. Well, that's true. So let's Africa. talk about Mali. Here you had a country that basically was taken over by a soldier that was trained in the United States with connection to the United States. That's not exactly a force for stability, I would say, no? Well, um, you know, our training does not transform people overnight. What we but, tried but it creates connections. I mean, it does create connections. And in Africa, especially, we just had Sisi, who was in Egypt, who was also trained in the United States. There's a certain pattern there, no? Like it was in Latin America. I, uh, you know, I'm not going to make the connection that okay. that the U.S. training caused him to have a coup. It certainly didn't prevent it. I think look, a fairly junior officer. Right. Reportedly, not the sharpest knife in the drawer, as they say. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, came over for a couple of our courses. You know, I, it's. You know, let's not overestimate our influence in transforming right. these militaries overnight. It was this failure to see the bigger picture and the fragility of the Malian state. But isn't that always the paradox, uh, Jennifer? That <clears throat> on the one hand, uh, you know, you want to fight extremism and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you support military dictatorships or, or military regimes right. and so on and so forth from, you know, Egypt to Nigeria. This, this and you always end up with not exactly the best of situations. Right. Well, this is a pattern for the U.S. all over the world. Mm. During the Cold War, we based our relationships on anti-communist credentials, not on a record of human rights or right. service delivery. And, you know, we, we ended up in relationships with Mobutu Seko and the apartheid government in South Africa, General you know, Sam Doe in Liberia, brutal dictators. And the post-Cold War, I mean, that remains to be the case today, right? Right. I think, you know, and, and this is one of the dilemmas of U.S. policy. Many of our best security partners right now in Africa are some of the worst authoritarians. So but it, President Obama came on the platform that says our short-term security needs could not overcome our long-term values. Well... And he is still at the White House second term. Well, look, we... Uh, as I say, this is something we faced in right. the Philippines, in Iran, in Iraq. This is the dilemma. If there's an immediate security threat, we tend to partner with, um, you know, the people that are we feel will combat them best. We agree that the, the fact that it's global doesn't make it any better. It makes it worse. Well, exactly. I mean, this is, it's not anything new in Africa. Mm. What is new in Africa is that we pay a lot more attention because we tend to think we have fewer interests in Africa. You know, I, you know we, we partner with, with other countries and are less critical of their human rights record because uh, it, it's almost like the U.S. can have morals where it doesn't have interests in a way. So, so what, 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 what are America's interests in Africa? Well... Obviously, there's the security agenda. There's a growing economic agenda as well. As we look at growing populations, the mineral and, and energy resources that Africa has, a rising 
population and middle class that can eventually, not in the next 10 years, but in the next 20 years, could provide an important market for U.S. goods and that other countries certainly are recognizing. That sounds, that sounds like what uh, Deputy Head of Africa, I think General Muller, I think, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, said something about that this is important in terms of the military strategy in order to guarantee the free f flow of natural resources out of Africa. Uh, sounds like a talk from past era, no? Uh, well, um, that that does. <laughs> um, I would I would maybe put it differently. Mm -hmm. um, that if African states are going to prosper, um, if African citizens are going to prosper, you have to have a level of peace and security in those countries. But the presumed counterinsurgency, counterterror, military solutions are certainly not leading to more stability. They're certainly leading to less stability in Africa. Well, I think that's debatable, actually. I mean, I, I do think they you think need... Africa is becoming more stable with military interventions? Well, I think it has become more stable over time. That's certainly sense. true. I mean, in terms of a UN or multilateral type operations that are meant to stabilize or are meant to uh, maintain ceasefires and the likes. But I'm talking more about the Chinese, French, American scramble for Africa and the way each are trying now to make their own inroads into Africa, and some of them through military means. Well, I, I, first of all, I, I kind of debate that they're trying to make inroads through military means. Um, you don't think the French and the Americans are going in there through military means? Well, they are, but I don't think they're trying to make political inroads through military means. So you don't think counterterrorism or the humanitarian intervention is in any way related to economic interest? You think it's all innocent? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, first of all, Africa's a big place and there's many there's been many different interventions over time I think there are some where the US feels that its direct interests are at stake encountering al-shabaab in, in in Somalia for example but in the last year you had 2013 14 military exercises with African militaries mm -hmm. what justifies that there are militia groups that are that are preying on civilian populations, the Lord's Resistance Army, some of the militia groups in Eastern DRC. Look at the chaos that is happening in Central African Republic right now with Christians and Muslims killing each other over, over what? Uh, uh, Somalia, Al-Shabaab terrorizing civilian populations. So they're real security threats. And yes, a political solution is preferable and that's the end game. But for some of those, you do need a military response and a security response. The objective of the Africa Command, first and foremost, was to build African capacities to, to manage those challenges. And there is a political aspect to that that is not the role of AFRICOM, but that also has to be done. Um, you don't think that's related to the fact that the Chinese are expanding no. in? No. You don't think the fact that, uh, that the American-African cooperation might be able to to better define where the Chinese can or cannot go? No. Um, you know, what's the U.S. going to do? Forbid the Chinese from investing in an African state that's a partner? Um, China has really outstripped the U.S. in terms of investment in Africa. Yeah. The U.S. is not going to go build roads and bridges in Africa as the Chinese have done. So you don't think the new regimes are still an indirect tool for the same colonial powers that they were once upon a time? or the new ones? Well, I think they have been. Obviously, in the Cold War, kind of the proxy proxy battles. For the French, I think they were very invested in certain countries and saw stability mm -hmm. uh, uh, as trumping any democratic. Uh, I think- I know the Chinese. Well, the, the Chinese have, have been less engaged on the military front. No, I mean, others. on terms of political support for governments that support Chinese interests. Yes. There's a couple of competitions happening. There's uh, the competition for economic access. Right. The Chinese have been really driving that. They've done a lot for Africa. Uh, you know, in, in, in net terms, I think they've been a positive influence in Africa. Uh, building infrastructure, bringing investment, uh, kind of saw Africa through that the financial crisis of, of 2008, um, and actually stimulating a competition by other global powers to invest and, and get economic access. This is good for Africa. And more and more, African governments, African citizens are saying, we don't want foreign assistance. We want investment. Investment brings jobs. It brings revenues. It brings infrastructure. It brings 
technology transfer. It brings skills that we don't have. So investment for Africans is a good thing. They want to create those trade links. That's, you know, that is... It comes also with a price tag, correct? When there's the governments are, are not necessarily the most well, wonderful, democratic... Well... It comes with a price tag. Well... Look at the grand, land grab. Well, More the, land has well, been grabbed in Africa than the this, whole west coast yeah, of the United th States. This is the thing. I mean, is that China's fault or is it the African government's fault? You know, these are sovereign governments that have agency. It's not like the 1950s where they were being told what to do. Um, yes, that is the problem. And I think, but, but I think you'll France, find that many Africans will really bridle at the notion that, oh, China is just taking advantage of you. Because they see the benefits that it's brought. Right. And, you know, who are you, the United States, to come say the, the, you know, this is or a bad French. thing for us? Or the French. But the United States have been involved mostly militarily. The last report I've seen, 2013, 535 activities, military activities on the continent. That doesn't bode well. Look, the, the military, it's a visible thing and it's something easily to glom onto. You know, we, we haven't talked about the multi-billion dollar investment the United States has made in HIV AIDS, for example. Mm. Uh, the major investment... It was under Bush. It was originated under Bush, surprise, surprise. Um, but those levels, despite kind of the fiscal constraints that the U.S. is facing, have remained... They have right, remained right. level over time. There's also the political... The, the a competition, I think, for political ideas and ideologies. You mean the scramble with the Chinese and the French? And, yeah, I think. And I the think, Turks. And, <laughs> yeah, I think the there Iranians. there is there is a competition for global norms, whether it's on human rights, on responsibility to protect, on issues of climate change, on the institutions of global governance. Those are going to be debates that play out. China has a particular view on those. We have a particular view much less than the economic competition, which is a good thing for Africa, or security competition. But you're not skeptical, Jennifer? You're not skeptical that behind the, the idea of the humanitarian intervention, those sorts of ideas, there is a salient economic and strategic interest for a superpower like the United States? Well, I think we want to remain relevant and influential in Africa. Um, and so I think that's where the game is going to be played. The U.S. and China are not going to come to military loggerheads in Africa. But this, this competition for ideas um, and for influence and relevance, I think that, that is where the competition goes. I mean, the Obama administration is going as far as pivoting to Asia in order to compete or to, to confront the Chinese there. Why not do it also in Africa? I would probably say it's not going to be a pivot, but maybe a shift. Uh, right. You know, it's you know, Africa. It's not going to eclipse China, the Middle East, uh, in terms of our strategic interests. There's definitely still a, a, a security gap in Africa and a security right. capacity gap. And that's meant to primarily to protect and to advance American interests or African interests. Well. The two sometimes actually overlap, right. not always. Thankfully. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, you know, there. Uh, that justifies the 1.2 billion extra now uh, investment in the in the military base in Djibouti. In turn, uh, does it justify? Well, I think there's 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 room for that. The problem is in our in the U.S. system, the military is probably the best resourced right. tool that we have. Um, so, you know, in security terms, it may well warrant that. If we had a limited budget, I would say we have to be very careful to balance that with the military. You can train a military in Mali to you know shoot straight and, and do the right thing. If the government that they work for is corrupt or weak. Um, no amount of military training is going to fix that country's security problem. Or perhaps the contrary. When you support, train a corrupt military government, that could probably lead to even more disasters. Uh, yes, you, but you have to get the, the mix of both, I think. It's good to end in an, in an agreement. <laughs> good grief. <laughs>